Hello, my name is Mariana Mazzucato. I'm a professor in economics of innovation at the Science Policy Research Unit of the University of Sussex. And I'm here to talk to you at the Reinventors Roundtable about how important it is to rethink and to reinvent how we think about the relationship between risks and, and rewards in the innovation economy. And, and I've just written a book that I'll be uh, focusing on some of the chapters from um, called The Entrepreneurial State, Debunking Private versus Public Sector Myths, where I basically argue that we currently have no framework through which to understand the massive risk-taking role of the public sector and hence have completely ignored a key question regarding should the state be earning back some direct rewards from that risk-taking. Specifically, I want to talk about the risk-sharing and the reward-sharing between public and private actors in the innovation economy. Now, most people agree that the state is important in innovation but because we have a very limited understanding of its role in innovation, this has also created a limited understanding in how the rewards uh, from innovation, when it actually does produce growth, and this can lead, of course, to decades of growth, should be shared between the different actors in the innovation ecosystem. And so my key point is that in economics, we have a framework called market failure theory, which basically says that the state is important to correct different types of market failures, be they the public good problem, which would be the situation when you have something like basic research, which has very high spillovers, and so it's hard to appropriate the returns. You therefore need government to uh, take on those kind of investments because the private sector won't. And so, you know, most people agree that you need the state to fund basic research, education, infrastructure, all examples of these public goods. What we don't understand is actually that at the basis of real kind of radical innovation, the innovation behind the iPhone, behind the internet, behind um, nuclear energy, behind the shale gas revolution, behind GPS, we actually have government doing so much more than just fixing little patches of market failures here and there. What we actually have is government through its decentralized network of different agencies uh, being willing and able in some countries and some regions in those countries to take on the extreme risk and uncertainty that actually underlies directly investing in innovation. Now, first of all, um, I should probably just back up a minute. And when I say risk and uncertainty, I mean the fact that you know most R&D projects fail. R&D from start to finish can take 15 to 20 years. So engaging in the process of uh, both envisioning a, a new area and then directly uh, funding the chain from the basic research to the early stage financing of the companies is very risky because, again, uh, there's lots of failure. And uh, what we don't have right now is an economic framework that can explain how government has actually really taken on massive risk and uncertainty in that process. It has not just been limited to the upstream uh, you know, market failure problem of basic research. It has also been extremely active through agencies like ARPA-E, uh, the National Institutes of Health, in the uh, applied research. And it has also uh, done an a lot, done a lot of early stage financing of companies themselves through programs like uh, the Small Business Innovation Research Program (SBIR), as well as SBIC grants. So Compaq and Intel got SBIR money. Apple got SBIC money. Um, now the point is not that government does this alone. Of course, the private sector is extremely important in that process, um, but we know that. We hear about that all the time. Steve Jobs' uh, biography talks about that, how important he was, how important his team was. Uh, there's not one sentence in that thick volume of Steve Jobs' uh, biography on the role that government played in actually financing all the technologies that make the iPhone so smart. So the internet, GPS, touchscreen display, the Siri voice activated system. And today we also don't hear the story behind, say, Elon Musk's um, who I, I, I would, well, I sort of think is the new hero of Silicon Valley, uh, just how important early stage uh, high risk finance was from the public sector and his success. So Tesla got 500 million in a guaranteed loan from the Obama administration, as did of course Solyndra, 
And so this is the whole point about risk. That's early stage, high risk finance. It sometimes wins and it sometimes loses. So in the case of Solyndra, we all know it lost. In fact, that hit the front pages of every paper saying, government, you basket case. Why are you getting so involved? You don't know how to pick winners. Just step back and do your job, which is fixing different market failures, funding the basics, education, the roads, research. Uh, what we don't admit is that because that same amount of money also went to Tesla, which was, of course, or is a huge success, really the question should not be should government pick winners or try to pick winners or not, but how should it um, think about risks and rewards. So perhaps it should think about it like venture capital does. Uh, differently, which I'll get back to later, but it should think about it in the sense that for you know every win, Tesla, you will have about 10 cylinders. But the difference is that when, say, Kleiner Perkins makes its wins with a company like Genentech, the profits that the VCs earn more than cover the losses that they lost <laughs> with uh, the, fail, the um, investments that failed, um, as well as those profits they make can also fund the next round. What we don't have in government is that kind of um, you know, flow, circular flow, revolving fund because we don't admit that the government actually played a, a key risk-taking, if you want, a lead agent role, but also the few people who might admit it that will say, yes, okay, fine, you know, we, uh, we funded Google's algorithm, we funded all the technologies behind the iPhone, we funded Tesla, the return will indeed come back to government through taxes. And the question is, is that true? Is that enough? So with the taxation argument, the problem is, as we know, many of these companies don't pay much tax. And they probably never will pay much tax because even, uh, you know, they legally can use different types of loopholes to uh, avoid tax. But also, taxes have actually fallen quite a bit when we think of things like capital gains tax from the rates that we had in the 60s and 70s when many of, say, the IT investments behind the IT revolution occurred. Don't forget that Eisenhower, you know, he was not a communist, he was a Republican general. Uh, the upper marginal rate under Eisenhower was close to 90% in real terms, which is not to say we should go back to that taxation system, but it's to say that today's taxation system, the upper marginal rate, the capital gains tax, corporate income tax, and all the loopholes there are, as well as all the different tax incentives that we've created, which also reduce government uh, tax revenue, it's not clear, or I believe it's not true, that the return to government for its risk-taking role beyond the market failure framework will come through taxes. And so the question that I would love to talk about with you in this uh, reinventors roundtable is what should we do? Should we just ignore the problem and allow these public funding agencies to suffer because they're not earning back a return? They're simply socializing risks and privatizing rewards? Um, or should we think of, say, direct mechanisms through which government can, in fact, earn back a reward for its risk taking? Whether that be retaining some equity in the investments, this happens in places like Scandinavia, where Citra, a public funding agency that funded Nokia, did retain equity. It also happens through, say, the China Development Bank, which today is alone practically financing three fourths of the green revolution around the world. Uh, but we could also consider income contingent loans. We do it for students, why not for companies? Uh, we could um, perhaps allow public funders, for example, the National Institutes of Health, to retain a golden share of the patents of the IPR. Uh, don't forget the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, spend about 32 billion a year on the knowledge base behind the pharmaceutical industry, which has been cutting its own uh, research and development, especially the R, um, so is no longer actually really taking on some of the most high-risk investments and yet is still charging extremely high prices. Another way, of course, that return could come back in that case is that government could have a say on the prices. Um, these very high prices on uh, medical drugs are often justified in terms, again, of the high risk taking that pharmaceutical companies do if we can prove that, in fact, they've been concentrating more on the D part of R&D, have been, in fact, disinvesting from the high risk R, increasing their investments on areas like share buybacks, which I think would be a different roundtable discussion, but it's very interesting, um, then I think 
you know, government should actually be able to say, well, if we're doing most of the high-risk research behind those drugs, maybe we should make sure that the taxpayer does not pay twice for the research and for these crazy prices. Anyway, there's all sorts of different schemes one could consider, but the point is there's currently no debate on this because we don't have the framework which even leads us to ask the question. So now that I've asked the question, I really look forward to discussing different possible answers to it.